So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Leila Takayama. So Leila is a research scientist and is here representing the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Robotics and Artific Artificial Intelligence. Um, Leila has quite a number of uh, things on her resume here. I'm reading through her bio. Uh, she's been at PARC at one point, and I'll, I'll make it short. Uh, Nokia Research Center, Willow Garage, and is now a senior researcher at Google X. Um, she has been named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and one of Technology Review's 35 Innovators Under 35 and Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business in 2012. Layla, Thanks. thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Also, um, this is where I hail from, so I did grad school here at Stanford, like just over there, so it's, it's nice to be back. Um, God, that bio was, sorry, I should have made it much shorter. Um, <laughs> so thanks for having me here. Um, I'm actually here um, mostly talking on behalf of the World Economic Forum. I'll talk a bit about you know what that is and how the WEF is planning to be actually supporting the design challenge at the end of this talk. Um, but I kind of just wanted to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we, me, who works more, mostly in a technology field, um, how we keep stumbling into the area of building technologies for the lifespan um, in order to start thinking more about how we do that in a more purposeful way. Um, so I just want to tell you a little story to begin with. Um, I started by working on these robots. I, you saw some pictures of these, of these before. This is the PR2 that was actually developed here at Stanford, um, started here at Stanford. It, PR2 stands for Personal Robot 2 in uh, Ken Salisbury's lab in mechanical engineering, um, who's actually back there now. That was the wooden prototype. This is the plastic and metal prototype um, that lives in you know a few dozen different universities. Um, and at that time, I was told, okay, you're a psychologist, you do that social science stuff, you deal with the humans, and we'll do with the robot. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be interesting. Um, so for four and a half years, I worked at this place just down the street in Menlo Park called Willow Garage, and we were really focused on open source robotics, meaning trying to get people to build on each other's code and contribute to a community of software as opposed to everyone building little robots in their little closets, writing code that would only run on their little robots. Um, and getting them to be more, more of a sort of building on the shoulders of giants kind of community. Um, while we were there, um, we actually had a coworker who was remote, and his name was Dallas. Dallas lived in Indiana, and you know, most of us here like living in California, but he hates being in California because it's really expensive, right? Like, I mean, just look at the real estate in Palo Alto, it's crazy. So he's like, well, I want to have a California salary, and I really like my coworkers there, but I'm going to live at home. Dang it, I am not moving to the West Coast. So we're like, fine, he's a really good electrical engineer. We'll put up with that. So this is what he looked like at every single meeting I went to with him. He was the voice in the box on the table. And that's not such a compelling way to be present in the office, right? Because literally we'd have arguments where people would be screaming at each other about some technical specification that had to be decided upon. And if someone didn't like what Dallas was saying, they would hang up on him. Um, and so he really did not have much of a presence in the space. Um, it was very frustrating. So what they then did, of course, because it's a bunch of roboticists, is we put a laptop running Skype on a cart that could be pushed around the office. And um, actually many people compare this to being in a wheelchair. So he would get pushed into meetings and then pushed into talks. Um, and it was kind of okay, because then at least I know what his face looks like, sort of. Um, but then he would be in a space like this and he'd be, you know, sitting off in the corner somewhere and you'd hear him being like, turn me to the right, I can't see the screen. And the whole room heard it. And so that, that wasn't so great. Um, and so one weekend, Kurt, his buddy in Dallas got together when he happened to be in California for the weekend. Um, and they built this. So he rolled into the office, basically like Skype on a stick on wheels. Um, and we didn't know what to call it, so first we're like, well, it's Dallas Bot. No, but Dallas is in Texas, so we're going to call it Texi. Um, and the coolest thing about it was he could barge into your office when you didn't answer his email, and he wouldn't move from that doorway until you answered. <laughs> um, and if you got into an argument, he literally did this. Two guys were arguing in the hallway, and he rolled between them and physically inserted himself into the discussion and, like, didn't really get his way, but he at least was heard. And we actually felt bad about shutting him off the same way that you could easily hang up on him when he was just the, the table box voice. Um, so it was really interesting because we're like, wow, you know, maybe this this thing that we don't want to call a robot, but you know, it's it's like Skype on a stick is pretty powerful. Um, and so what we did was we bought, we made a bunch more of these because we're like, well, maybe we just like it because like we like robots. And you know, that's not a real product if only we buy the thing that we make. Um, and so, <laughs> 
We, uh, we're building these things. You may have seen it before. If you watch the Big Bang Theory, that is Shellbot. We did not copy them. They called us up when they saw our YouTube video, and they're like, we want one of those. And make it look a little more hacky. So they actually like took off a bunch of parts, and they had like wires hanging out the side to make it look cooler, like more Caltech-like. Um, and uh, not to, I mean, Caltech's great. Um, and the new commercial version of this, you may have seen at places like TED, where Snowden was actually using these to beam into the TED conference and be on stage without physically being president of the United States, because there would be ramifications for him um, if he did that in person. Uh, so just to give you a sense of like the research we've done here, um, we were really curious to know, like, you know, what if normal people use these? <laughs> what if it wasn't geeks like us? Um, and so we put them in a whole bunch of companies around the Bay Area, used a bunch of, you know, sort of qualitative research methods in order to figure out like what are people really going to do with this you know what are they not going to use it for how are they going to hijack it and they did um, these are the locations where the remote operators were located but all of their robotic bodies were physically present in the bay area here um, so you know what do people do if you look across the board you know people kind of do what they do normally they exchange ideas they ask questions they get answers they show off they socialize um, and I think what's even more interesting than what they do is where they did it. Um, so if you think about like your normal video conferencing systems, you see them in the big meeting rooms, right? Like maybe ones down the hall. Um, but if you look at where these robots are used, they're actually used in the hallways and in communal spaces. So the people who are really effective at using them discovered that if you hang out by the coffee machine, that's where people are held captive for about two minutes while their coffee is percolating. And so that's when you can chit chat with them because you know they're available, just sort of like not doing anything else anyway. The other thing they would do is sort of roam the hallways and pounce on people who didn't look like they were in a big rush. And so you sort of build this social presence in the space too. Um, there's three big things that we saw happening here. One was just like showing up, you know, like coming here physically, bothering to, you know, come after work to be at a conference and sit your butts in a chair shows commitment to the design challenge. It shows commitment to this group of people, and that's a big deal. And even though it might not be quite the same as being there in a robot, you know, coming here in person, sometimes you just can't be there in person. Um, and so depending on what the alternative is, this can actually be a really good way to communicate to your team that you care enough to be there. Another one, of course, is capturing attention, right? So standing in the hallway um, is a good way, or blocking the doorway is a good way of getting someone to answer your question. Um, one story that I like to tell about this one is uh, you could actually hear it coming down the hallway because the wheels would make this like wee little sound. Um, and sometimes I would have an email in my inbox that Dallas had sent me with a question that I didn't want to answer. And if I heard it coming, I'd run out the door the other way because I could run faster than the robot could move. And then he wouldn't find me. And I'd go out the exit door because I knew he couldn't open the doors. Um, and then I'd go into the email because I didn't want to talk to him about it. Um, so, you know, there's workarounds. We've made them more quiet so they can sneak up on you now um, if they wanted to. Um, the last one that kind of feels touchy-feely, but it's actually, I think, the most important, was building social connections. So, you know, we had this pool table at work, and we play pool, and we weren't very good at it. But it was sort of a bonding thing that we do after work. And these guys can't play pool because the robots didn't have arms, but they could heckle the guys playing pool and make fun of them when they made bad shots. And that actually helped to build this sense of like you as a human being, not just you as my coworker, who I only use because you're useful to me um, in the meetings. And it was, it was a really nice way to actually see more of a, a social connection being built and creating a sense of teamness as opposed to like we're just a group of people who work in the same space. Um, many, many, many people, when I would show them this work, would say like, oh, that'd be great for visiting grandma in the retirement community, which felt a little offensive to me. And I was like, you know, what if grandma doesn't want that? Um, what if she wants something else? What if grandpa wants something else? And so we decided to actually engage with the Avenidas community in Palo Alto and say, all right, let's actually work with the community that you all think you're talking about and figure out like what did they want not what what do we want and wish upon them but like what is it that the people who we think we'd be helping would actually be interested in and worried about um, and so we decided to have a bunch of excuse me older adults who are living independently in the Palo Alto area come over and actually try the robot right not talk about robots in this abstract sci-fi crazy way but like really drive it around and really get to be visited by someone in the robot and have an experience before talking about speculating about what a technology is and is not and is good for and is bad for. Um, so 
we did a lot of interviews here. I remember a lot of people said, I want to visit grandma. It's going to be the grandchildren. It's all about the grandchildren. Actually, it's all about the buddies and the friends and those people who are really important to maintain those tight social connections to. The important people in your lives do include the grandchildren, but it's not only the grandchildren. Um, and that was really important. One really funny one that we kept hearing was like, I don't want my kids coming in whenever they want. Like, they need to knock. Like, I need to have a way of, like, not answering the phone. Maybe I don't feel like talking to my kids today. Like, it's my space. Um, another, you know, one of the big benefits, of course, is reducing social isolation. But also, you know, what if you could visit your doctor via one of these telepresence robots instead of having to get in the car and go to the hospital? Because you really just don't feel up to it today. But you probably should get that checkup. So reducing um, travel time, for example, could be one of those things that we might be able to do. Um, the biggest concern I thought was going to be safety, because having worked around robots, I worry all the time about robot safety. They run over your toes, they could smush you against walls, like there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. But the number, thing, number one thing they worried about was actually etiquette, because we've spent decades now building up this social etiquette around telephones where, you know, you, you can talk to my answering machine, that's okay, because I just don't feel like talking at this moment. You don't get to dictate when we're going to have an interaction. Um, and that was the, by far the biggest worry. In the numbers, it doesn't look really big, but in the conversations, it was the most deeply felt concern about this technology. And actually, if we looked back at the other studies we've done in offices, there were a few people who were kind of annoying to their coworkers. Uh, and if they were annoying, what would happen to their robot is it would get put in a closet. And so they could log into the robot, but then they'd have to knock on the door to get out of the closet which gave their coworkers the opportunity to just like be like, oh, we weren't there. We didn't hear you knocking. Sorry, I guess you can't come in today. Um, and so having some control over when you want to interact and not interact was also very important. Um, finally, this was my favorite finding from the whole study. Um, everyone kept saying we want to visit grandma in the retirement community, but actually the thing that people were the most excited about was getting out, not having people come in, right? I want to go to that baseball game and heckle those players with my friends in the stadium. That's different from watching on TV. I want to be part of that, that scene, part of that audience, part of that crowd at the concert, um, and not necessarily just like sitting at home and having people visit me all the time. Um, because there's sometimes some places that I've been, like I've been to Yankee Stadium and I want to go back there, but it's really expensive and it's kind of a pain to get there. And like, yeah, I'll go to the local game, but I don't really feel like doing a cross country flight. Um, other spaces that are really interesting for, for them in this particular set of people was going to museums, going to theater performances, and basically like flipping the entire equation on its head, right? Because originally we'd gone in hearing like, oh, you should put them in the retirement community. And really what they were saying was, no, put it everywhere else out in the world. And by the way, it's not just for us, right? My mom happens to be going to Paris now for the first time in her entire life, and she's ecstatic about it. But what if she could have gone earlier? Right? What if it didn't have to cost so much to go to these exotic places that we wish we could go to? Um, and for some reason or other, we just can't. So in that case, I think robotic telepresence could be an interesting potential option. Um, I do want to mention that you know none of this research is done just by me. I have a lot of really great collaborators, um, many of whom have now scattered to the winds because Willow Garage has imploded. Um, but many have scattered and landed at Google. <laughs> so we're still in the local area. Um, and right now I'm at Google X. Um, but today I'm actually here on behalf of the World Economic Forum. And I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background for what that is. When they first called me up, I had no idea who they were. So don't be embarrassed if you didn't know either, because I had no idea. Um, so the World Economic Forum is a nonprofit organization that's actually not linked to any particular um, political group or partisan group or even a national group. So they are based in Sweden. If you've ever heard of the Davos con conference, that's the one they run. Um, and people like me volunteer for them in order to help them figure out what are the things that those people in Davos should be talking about. Laura is in the Asian Council and that we actually met together at that conference where we were setting up the agenda for all of these world leaders to go talk to. So it's kind of a nice venue for like bringing real content to the discussions that are happening up at that higher level. Um, they're really committed to tackling sort of the major trends that are impacting global economies, right? Thinking about going from the pyramid to the rectangle is a big deal for the global economy, not just for one country, but like everybody, everybody's worried about this. Some countries are going to get hit with, with it a little bit earlier, and the better we can be prepared for that and actually lean into it and do good with it, the better 
um, the more prepared we'll be for that new future. Um, as part of that effort, they set up these things that are called the Global Agenda Councils. And what that means is you have a set of experts in each one of the fields. Um, so I'm in the Council on Robotics and AI. There's a Council on Aging. There's other councils on things like mega cities um, and different, you know, um, different world regions. And the idea is that we come together, we meet as councils, and we talk across the councils to help figure out, like, what are the big risks? What are the big changes happening in the world and what are the things that like we really need to be thinking about um, at a global level not just at a local level this is actually um my third year on the council and even though you know robotics and ai sounds like a very technical thing and all we do is think about robots all day most of our council is actually people who are social scientists who are really worried um, and actively working on more of the the social the political the cultural issues surrounding all of these technologies um, and we fortunately got to meet up with the Council on Aging um, in Abu Dhabi last year and we were talking about like, you know, people keep talking about like, we should be using robots for older adults, but we don't, we don't really know how. And so, you know, talk with us, like, what are the problems? What are the needs? Um, because we don't want to end up in a situation we, where we, for example, put robots in a retirement community for no good reason. Um, that would be terrible. <laughs> and that's a waste of time for everyone. So. Um, together, our two councils decided that this would be a good chance to support the Stanford Center on Longevity in the design challenge because this is the perfect convergence of having an emerging technologies um, combined with design thinking and really deeply understanding, you know, what is it like to grow older? What is it like to be mobile in different ways? Um, and to make that that's in a way that's not stigmatizing, right? Like it doesn't have to be a technology for this population of people. It can be for everyone at the all ages, right? We thought those telepresence robots would be great for young tech workers in the Bay Area. And it's turning out that they're actually useful for many different kinds of niches that were not expected before because being socially connected to others is this deeply felt human need that doesn't just exist for, you know, tech workers. Um, so we're going to be supporting the design challenge um, in a few different ways, just promoting it through the networks, trying to get more people to be supporting and participating in the challenge, um, helping out with the selection committee. And we're also adding a prize um, for the business participants who are going to be Anyone who puts in an entry that's very technology oriented, we're gonna be setting up a new prize um, just for that particular type of contribution to the design challenge. And the details of that are getting worked out over the next couple of months, but feel free to ping me if you have any questions about it. Um, and my colleagues, David Peters and Corey Lathan have been really leading that charge, um, working with Ken and figuring out how we're gonna make that happen. So with that, I'll take questions. Are there any questions for Layla? You? I think I'm going to be Ajahn Provocateur again. It was a very exciting kind of thing, but I was a little disturbed by your, I think, next to last slide when you had the council uh, on aging. Yeah. Or both of your councils. Yeah. Uh, I can see only one person there who might be aging. Oh! So these are, sorry. These are actually just selected headshots. That's one person from each council. But well, it is, they it all is look a weird pretty shot. Young yeah, that is me. a good and point. And I think you need to have older people. Because yeah. not only do we want to interrelate with you, mm -hmm. and I'm very excited of hearing some ideas that I've been pushing and being put up, <laughs> but we want to be also in a sense of leadership. Right. And it isn't that we'll take over the leadership, but yeah. we want to be part of that. Yeah, and I would, my first recommendation would be to expand that council yeah. and have some people who are aged on mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and still have their wits. We all agree that some of us sometimes are not always yeah. with it, but that would be helpful also. <laughs> Even for young people, yeah. right? We're, yeah. we're having somebody who has some difficulties right. on the council might be helpful. Yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. Other questions? Stephen? Yeah. Um, great presentation, thanks. I just, I guess I had a sort of definitional question. Yeah. Um, what is a robot? <laughs> because I see that beam thing, and to me it looks like an iPad on wheels. Yeah. And to me a robot has its own mind and it's gonna take over the world. Yeah. What is a robot? Um, it is a very deep philosophical question. 
Um, and it depends who you ask. Um, so my, my personal definition of it is very, very broad. So in my sense, you know, anything that can sort of sense something in the world, um, make a decision about it, and then take an action on it would be a robot. So in my very, very loose sense, right, a thermostat is a robot. Um, and actually, if you look at places like Nest, right, Yoki Matsuoka, who is one of the leading technologists on it, um, she's a roboticist, <laughs> and she's working on thermostats because, I think, once robots, robots become useful, they stop being called robots. They start being called thermostat or washing machine or dishwasher, right, because they, they, they have a function, they have a value. Um, and so, in some sense, robots are things that are not useful, um, but they're, <laughs> they're often things that are in research, right? We're still trying to figure it out. It's like saying computer. Like, computer used to mean it's a calculator, but now it means something more. In the beam, in particular, it is, it is telepresence, right? And they actually don't call it a robot. Um, they call it, I think, a remote presence device or something like of that type because there is no autonomy in it. Um, we did try adding autonomy to it. So for example, many people would run into the walls or run into each other with it because it's hard to drive. Um, and so we added obstacle avoidance. So just like the self-driving car that won't hit you know, a traffic light or a post, um, this thing wouldn't let you run into a wall. Um, and people actually got really frustrated with that because they're like, I wanted to knock on the door and now you're not letting me hit any obstacles. So now I can't knock on the door so no one will let me out of the closet, right? And so we have to be really careful about like when and where we add autonomy. Um, but yeah, what is a robot is one of those questions I think is never going to go away. <laughs> um, and I have a feeling, hopefully, you know, the kinds of projects that we'll see here at the Design Challenge are going to be so darn useful um, that we won't have to call them robots at all. But you could still use that stuff as in the back end. Yeah, we've got time. Maybe. In that case, just a quick follow-up. There's a big a conference in the UK recently which looked at the ethics of robots, and the, the conclusion, the net-net, was that the Isaac Asimov rules, oh, if geez. you know those, yeah. are, were still valid as far as they're concerned. I wondered if you had any thoughts on ethics and robots. Are we on record? No. no. Nobody's tweeting this. We are on video. We are on video. Um, we should talk offline. Um, but for my Asimov was a scientist, but the laws actually came from his fiction writing. Um, which is a different lens, I think, to interpret his laws. Um, and many of his, well, most of his laws are actually incredibly hard to implement. So, for example, you know, robotic perception or computer vision, um, it's still really hard to tell a person apart from a tree in many, many cases. Um, and so if you tell it, you know, don't hurt people, it doesn't even know what a person is to begin with. And so it's really hard to act on those laws. Um, and so one of the things I've been thinking about recently actually has been like, what, what would the laws be that we could actually implement um, such that they would do no harm, really? Um, but Asimov, you know, took a start at it, but that's not where I would stop. I'd like to thank Layla for, uh, for the talk this evening. That was really interesting. Thanks. Thank that's you. Funny.